Lecture number eight, part two of the introduction of bonding and nomenclature. <coughs> so in the last lecture, we talked about actually the bonding that occurs between these compounds and also how to name them. So we talked about whether it's a non-metal, non-metal come together to form a covalent bond, which we then name in one convention, or if we have a metal and a non-metal come together and form an ionic bond, and then we name them. <clears throat> You'll see here that we also have a non-metal and a group of non-metals. These come together. We haven't talked much about those. We mentioned them, but we're going to spend some time talking about those and some other types of these ionic compounds and how to name them. <clears throat> so, the, most of what we talked about last time was these monoatomic ions, a single element or atom that has a charge from the loss or gain of electrons. There's also this other type, these polyatomic ions, where we have a group of elements that come together, and they're, all of them together have a charge. So we have the, these polyatomic ions are primarily covalently bound themselves, but the, all in total they have either a positive or negative charge. And we'll see how the naming convention that goes along with those today. Unfortunately, the best way to know these polyatomic ions is actually to memorize them. So you can see here uh, table 2.5 out of your text where you shows a list of all these polyatomic ions that you need to have memorized. Things like ammonium, acetate, cyanide, hydroxide, chlorate, nitrate, permanganate, carbonate, dichromate, phosphate, these types of things. But we're going to spend some time today talking about this, these naming conventions themselves for these polyatomic ions, paying particular attention to these root ions, the nitrate, the phosphate, the carbonate, the chlorate, and the phosphate. All of these are what we call oxo polyatomic ions. They all have oxygen and some other element. And we've, there's a naming convention that goes along with those based on these root ions, the eights. And we see <coughs> that if we memorize these eights, there's a certain level where we have a certain number of oxygens, we call them whatever the element is, and then ending in eight. If we increase the number of oxygens, have one more oxygen than this root we've memorized, we add the prefix per, so it would be per eight. If we then go back to our root poly, or oxo, the eight form, if we reduce the number of oxygens by one, we would change the eight to an eight. And <clears throat> if we reduce the number of oxygens by two, we add the prefix hypo and leave the ending as eight. So let's see how this plays out in terms of a, an example, the chlorate ion. <clears throat> so the chlorate, that root ion is ClO3 minus. Right? It's the one we just have to memorize as the eight. If we added one more oxygen to make it ClO4 minus, then we call that the per chlorate ion. So the chlorate is the ClO3 minus. If we reduce that to the ClO2 minus, then we change that ending to ite. So it's this the chlorite ion. Reduce it again, so there's only one oxygen, ClO minus. We call that the hypochlorite ion. <clears throat> Notice here that all we're doing is changing the number of oxygens present. The charge stays the same, that root uh, element stays the same, we're just varying the number of oxygens. So in, now instead of memorizing, you know, six or seven of these, if we memorize this naming convention, we can memorize that, those root, those eight ions, and then work apart from those based on the number of oxygens away from that root. So then we can talk <clears throat> about these polyatomics um, very similarly. We can, some of these exist actually as acids. An acid in this case can be defined as a substance that yields hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. So if we look, for example, HCl, <clears throat> we can name this just as a, we have a metal, non-metal, or, or, excuse me, and we can say then we have the cation is the hydrogen, the anion is the chlorine, so this would be hydrogen chloride, pure substance. But when it goes in, dissolved in water, we actually break these ions apart, like we talked about in class. So we have a, a combination of H plus and Cl minus. Now we have the ability to generate these H plus in solution, so we call this hydrochloric acid. And these oxoacids, these polyatomics, also 
have these capabilities, things like nitric acid, carbonic acid, and sulfuric acid. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about how to name these. For these simple diatomic acids, they usually start with hydrogen. So we just simply change the beginning of the name to, with hydro, and then we change the end of the name from the ide, from the previous naming convention, to ic, and then we add the word acid. So HCl becomes hydrochloric acid. HBr becomes hydrobromic acid. Very similar, hydrogen starts at the beginning, so we have hydro, and then we change it to the ending to ic acid. <clears throat> These oxo acids, the polyatomics, are more involved. So we have, since we have so many different varieties, there's some naming conventions here. If it ends in eight, we change that ending to ic acid. If it ends in it, then we change that to us acid. And any prefixes that are there are left alone. So for example, HNO3, the NO3 is the nitrate polyatomic ion. So the eight turns to ic, and this becomes nitric acid. The next one, HClO. ClO3 is the eight ion. This has two less oxygen, so this is the perchlorite ion have the hydrogen in front, so this becomes perchlorous acid. So following these rules, we, we can now name a whole variety of polyatomic acid ions and acids based on simple naming rules. <coughs> the next type of compounds that we're going to talk about are what we call hydrates. In these hydrates, when the compounds form or become solid, water has the ability to become trapped inside those crystals. So that they're a compound with a specific number of waters attached to them. So if we look, for example, at these two compounds, we have copper sulfate with some water attached to it, five waters in this case, is the blue, and then copper sulfate without any waters, which is the white. So when we trap these waters, we're not only we're, cha we're not changing the composition really, we're just adding water, which changes the physical appearance. So this first one, the copper with the water, hydro or sulfate with the water involved, we would have to include the name of that, plus the number of waters that are associated with. So this becomes copper 2 sulfate because the copper is a transition metal. Pentahydrate, we use the same prefixes we had in the covalent bonds to indicate the number. So 5 being penta, this is copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. As opposed to when there's no water present, we would just call that copper 2 sulfate. So now we should be able to name just about any compound we come up against with um, some fairly, or we're sort of ignoring some of the larger organometallics, but right now we have this solid naming foundation. We can actually name 90% of the compounds that we have, and from that name we can get the formula, or for the formula we can get the name. I don't get it!